How would you like to grow your business the easy way, and in my humble opinion, the fun way, through speaking? Yes, you can literally speak your way to more business, and we can show you how. You know, when I started my coaching business 15 years ago, I struggled making only $900 in the first two years. Yeah, you heard that right. Less than $1,000 in two years. The problem? I was busy running around to networking events and handing out business cards, trying to help everyone, you know, everyone. Then I took the stage for the first time in my life and began speaking and teaching about the strategies I coached on. And when I really got my message dialed in, my business went literally from three figures a year (laughs) to seven figures. The secret I finally realized is that when you take the stage, you instantly become seen as the leading voice in your niche or industry. Today, we show entrepreneurs just like you and just like I was how to dominate your niche by becoming the leading voice, not just another expert. We run an incredible business mastermind speaker training program. It's called The Leading Voice. You guessed it. If you head over to leadingvoiceplatform.com slash podcast and grab my free roadmap, Eight Pillars to Profitable Speaking. This free roadmap outlines the exact eight secret weapons you need to truly become the leading voice in your niche. This is exclusively for my podcast listeners. You go to leadingvoiceplatform.com slash podcast and start speaking your way to more business. Speaking of getting booked, this podcast is about one thing, getting booked to speak more. Whether you are an established speaker or a newbie, we want to see your career take off. Hundreds of speakers are hired every single day. And you are next. Let's jump in with your host, Matt Browning. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back to Speaking of Getting Booked. I'm your host, Matt Browning. Man, I'm so glad you're here right now because whether you're a veteran speaker, you're a newbie in the business, you're keynoting, you're platforming, you're sponsoring, whatever it is, You want to get on stage more, and that's the entire purpose. We need exposure for our speaking and for our business. Today, I have someone who can uh, drastically improve the learning curve for us, and her name is Tony Caruso. Tony, I've known Tony for a few years now, quite a few years. She produces events all over the place. She resides in Los Angeles area. I'm going to call it Los Angeles area. You can correct me, Tony, because I'm sure there's a, a suburb that's important. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, Tony has been a former managing director for eWomen Network for the chapter uh, up in that spot, as well as probably the biggest thing she does is uh, running her company Caruso Signature Events for over 30 years in marketing and public relations. Uh, all of her professional experience, she work, she's worked in the entertainment field with celebrity management firms, talent management agencies, video production companies and personally producing several national commercials. So one of the reasons I want to bring Tony on the show is because she has that kind of entertainment-esque uh, side, and then she also has the boots on the ground running signature events, workshops for speakers. So we're going to talk with Tony about some good practices, uh, good and bad, what to do, what not to do. If you want to get booked on platform stages, we'll talk about that a little bit more. She's done intimate business lunches with high net worth individuals. She's done educational seminars, shareholder meetings, offsite retreats and team building, movie screens, business launches, company picnics with over 5,000 guests. Uh, Every event is different in size. So we want to break down and figure out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, it's my favorite way to start a show is when (laughs) when we're excited to be here (laughs) and we are like... Yeah. The, the cool thing is, you know, I, I've, I've known you for a little while now and I, I genuinely, it's just, it's fun to be around you. You're one of the good humans out there. So I know we're gonna have a good time today. Um, let me jump in to say, so for 30 years, you've been doing this. So how old were, like, were you like five years old? You planned your first uh, birthday party event for someone? How, did you, how old were you when you first started getting into this? And what was your first venture into either events or speaking in this whole world we're living in? Whoa. So no, I wasn't five, but um, <laughs> I tell a story that I'm an eventaholic and I was born that way because I have a summer birthday. And when your birthday's in the summer, you don't get the cake and ice cream at school. You don't get the parties. Everybody's on vacation. So you get maybe five or six people at your birthday parties. It was just kind of sad being me, you know, I'm doing a little pity party here. Poor you. um, 
as I grew up, I went, you know, I'm, I'm going to start having parties on my own. And I started by giving myself my own birthday parties. By the time I was in middle school, I was planning them and doing it. And I just think I have a mother that was a planner and she loved to throw parties. So I was born up in that world. And I was the one that was doing all the dances at school. I remember so were doing you even talking junior high and high school. This is what- high school. I was doing all the dances, producing them. And our junior prom was Stairway to Heaven. So that tells you how old I am. Come on. And, um, and then I remember being there and doing all the centerpieces and organizing it all. And all the girls with their hair and curlers. And they all had to leave to go get ready. And I wasn't even going to the dance. I hadn't been invited, but I was the one putting it on. So that's kind of been just something in me all my life that I just have that innate ability to throw a party and to organize it. It's just, I I believe it's my gift. So as I got older and got into the business world, there was always holiday parties or company picnics or um, different events that businesses would do. So in the corporate world, I was doing all of those just as an extra part of my uh, job description. And then when I, um, it's going on kind of long, but then I got married late, had a son late. So I became a stay-at-home mom and I became the PTA president and the head of the school board and those kind of things. So if, how, how late is late? Just curious. Cause that's, a I got married term. at 41 and my son was born when I was 43. Oh, okay. That would probably be by most definitions later than usual. Yes. Yes. Wow, I was, so cool. I was a late bloomer. So you're, so you're in your forties now going, you know, bringing, you know, going back through the elementary circuit. Yes. You, I'm sure you were possibly very different too, compared to say a mom in her maybe mid or early twenties where you know you have this life experience, you've had all these planning, and you can look at PTA and you can look at the different elements of school a lot differently, I'm sure. And my experience that I had, I had brought along with me. So I remember taking over the jogathon because when my son was in kindergarten, he was in this jogathon, and I thought, oh, this isn't very fun. It could be so much better. And so the next year, I thought, okay, I'll donate my time and I'll do it. And they had made maybe eight thousand dollars. In previous years in their jogathon, I took it over and I made forty five thousand dollars the first year. Holy because, moly for kindergarten! Yeah, I mean, it was well, school, it was, it was elementary, elementary school. school so, do you think this is uh, the the philosophy of kind of throwing a party, quote unquote? Do you think that philosophy is something that's really um, a theme that you've carried with you through the different types of events, corporate and seminars that you promote? Like, is that something the way you see? the event, hey, it should feel a little bit like a party. It's not, it doesn't have to be this boring stick in the mud kind of event. Is that? Exactly. And I come from the eyes of the audience. I am, I am very aware of what's going on in the room. And a lot of people, when they put on events, they're so focused on what they're doing on stage and what their speech is going to be and how much their offer is going to be. And, you know, they're all involved in themselves when in reality, they should be involved in who are the people in the room and what are they going to experience and feel and what are they going to get out of it? Because if you give them a good time and it's a good party and it doesn't have to be that party, but I mean, you know, you've invited them. You The whole experience starts with that first invitation and goes all the way through to the event. And if they're getting excited and they come in the room excited and and ready to learn something, and then you just get on stage and you share and you give, then everybody wins and they walk out wanting more. And isn't that exactly what you want out of an event? And and that's a big part of when you go in and put on events for people, whether it's companies or individuals, you're bringing that to them. So and what I've seen often, because you know, I've been at events that, that you've been leading, running, uh, or producing from the back, whatever language you want to call it. And I love, I can watch the speaker or the head, so to speak, right? The brand. Um, I can watch them engaging with people and focusing on the speaking and doing what they're supposed to do. And then you're taking care of all the, the big things and little things in the background. Let me back up just a minute, though. I'd like to ask you, because you've done a lot of corporate events, different kinds of events over the years, right? Correct. Let's talk about just, did you ever have and book speakers to come in or trainers to come into any of these type of events? I know sometimes it's a corporate party or a picnic and maybe you don't have a speaker, but did you ever put on events for, for companies where you had a speaker 
Um, if so, what, how did you go about booking them or finding them? And how could we get ourselves in front of someone like you more uh, in that role when you were doing that? All right. When I was doing corporate, it was more we used on-site people because in the corporation, the way you were doing the events is they were meetings and they were, um, we were using our own people because that's what we were selling. So, so if so it was, site, oh, so yeah. you put on a, uh, maybe for clients or for prospects, you do an event like that. Is that what exactly? We well, I worked for city national bank for, okay. and I was, um, their event person. And so what we do there is we would go to the different um, departments within the bank and maybe it was the investment group and we we'd find an audience for them and we'd put on an event and they'd talk about investments. So it was, it was, they were sharing information, but it was bank employees that were doing the speaking. Now, right now I am working on Women in Technology International and it's a large event in San Jose in June. Now that one, we are looking for outside um, speakers and they had a call for speakers. So what you have to do is if you are a speaker, you need to look at all these different conferences that are happening in your area, outside your area, because basically if it's outside the area, you're probably going to have to pay for yourself to travel there. So if you don't have that kind of money, look at what's going on in the area around you what kind of conferences are being done and is your brand in alignment with what their messaging is. And there'll be a call for speakers and you just put your name in and you put as much information about you and what you'd like to speak on that you think would be interesting and different than um, what everyone else is speaking about, but totally in alignment with what their messaging or their mission is. Okay, so um, let, let's break down a couple of those things real quick because we went okay. through a couple of different contexts. I want to make sure we really uh, we get like the actionable step of how to do this. So, when you were doing so, some corporate events realize, and I'm going to talk to the audience, of course, because you guys are listening as well as you. Uh, but for the corporate events, sometimes there's events where they're not really going to be bringing in the speaker anyway. They want to showcase their people, and that makes sense. But in the in the form of this one you're talking about here, the women in technology, that is. Is that kind of like an associations? It might not be an association, but an association style conference where you're going to get people. Is it all entrepreneur audience? Is it all a uh, small business audience? Is it a, a trade type organization? Where does that it's, fit in? It's more for people that are working in corporations in technology. So um, our speakers are blockchain, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, uh, AI, machine learning, those type of speakers. So it's very tech um, heavy. And then the other thing you mentioned that I think is really key to hone in on is sometimes we think like as a new speaker, especially like, oh, I, I just want to be a keynote speaker and I'm going to get flown all over the world and it's going to be amazing. Because you hear these stories of someone who says, well, they flew me first class to Dubai and paid my speaker fee or whatever. But I love that you mentioned that some of these organizations, there's plenty of, say, cryptocurrency speakers or blockchain speakers and in a pretty similar uh, industry, but there's plenty of them. So that means if they have someone, if they're putting on in Los Angeles and they have someone in the area, they're going to say, great, uh, we'll pay your fee maybe, or maybe it's a non-fee thing. I don't don't know what the setup is. Um, Can you speak a little bit to how, how associations and how events like this, how do they not just choose the speaker, but how do they choose the speaker budget set up? What's the difference between saying, hey, we have a $15,000 speaker fee and that's what our budget is. So we're looking for that type of person versus, hey, we're looking for a speaker who wants an opportunity to showcase themselves in front of all these people and we'll pay your expenses or, hey, and then all the way to, you know, you and I, we put on seminars where speakers will pay sponsorships to come to speak. How does one make the choice of what kind of speaker spot to have because you've had so many different uh, roles and you've seen all of the above. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense, but that's a, that's a long question to answer. It might Um, be. (laughs) I believe let's, let's start with the ones where they're going to pay you. They're only going to pay you if you're a name, they're not going to pay you unless you have a huge following and you've got like now in the modeling industry, let's just take that for example. The modeling industry it used to be the prettiest, skinniest girl got the job. If she fit into the clothes, she was the right look. She got the job. Well, now 
It's all about how many Instagram and follow and followers do they have. And the larger um, influencer they are, the more likely they're going to be chosen to be uh, a part of that campaign because they are going to then sell it to their people in their Instagram. So when you look at it that way in the speaking world, who is going to bring in the most people? Now, for a women in technology, if you had someone who was the president of Facebook and or you had some name person, yes, you'd probably pay to have them come because they're going to bring in your audience. If you don't have that kind of influence, you have to start out by either number one, finding places to speak for free. And literally, if you don't, if you're not really good at this and you haven't been do- doing it for a while, get out there and speak at your chamber of commerce, speak at um, local meetups, find networking groups that you can speak at. There are all kinds of smaller groups in the area to start with just to get yourself so that you're confident and you're, you've got your speech down and you know what you're doing. Then look at conferences and workshops and things that are being done in the area. And all you have to do is Google that and it'll come up and find ones that are in alignment with what your messaging is. Don't think that you're an entrepreneur and I'm going to teach someone how to write a book and I'm going to try and get into the Women in Technology event when we're looking at AI and machine learning. It's not a good fit. Just because you're a good speaker and you speak well on that, it's not a fit for that conference. So find those that are in alignment with your, with your messaging and what you do, and then apply to them. Also, as eWomen, going back to being a managing director at eWomen, the people that would come to my events and see what they were like and get to know me, they were the ones that I wanted to have speak on my stage because I got to know them. If you just out of the blue send me your email and say, I want to speak in front of your people because I share everything that everyone's supposed to do. I'm a life coach and I can change lives. Well, so <laughs> can I everybody. Have a you know? for, I'm like, I know. So you're so, saying, if uh, I don't mean to cut you off on this, but that's okay. Just, that's okay. Just to, just to revisit a, a moment ago, the big takeaways I'm taking is number one is don't go in expecting, especially on day one or even year one or year two, expecting to try to just get these paid keynote talks. Um, the big thing that you say people are looking for today is either name value. And what I heard from you is you can get your name value for, because your name, because maybe it's a Les Brown or a Tony Robbins or whomever. Of course, those are bigger names. Um, or your name value could come from the company or your background. So if you you know, are high up in a, you know, a Facebook or a Zappos or something like that, that could be something too. But if you're Correct. not bringing eyeballs to it. Now, what about if you say, I don't have a high name value, like people don't know my name, but you're going to see a bunch of Instagram followers that could still in a way help because they're going to look at, you know, would I be willing to pay this person as a speaker? Because I think they, they're a draw. They could bring eyeballs. They could bring butts and seats. They could bring, uh, fill up this event potentially for me. That's what people are looking for. Is it the name? Is it the company? Or is it even just simply the following because you're an influencer? All exactly. those things are useful to have. If you don't have that, get yourself booked wherever you can, especially locally. Because, I mean, shoot, like, like you said, there's, there's Rotary Clubs, there's Chamber of Commerce, there's Meetups, there's um, every, oh, uh, what is it, Kiwanis Club. There's a, a 101 of these different things and plenty of them, right? Why not go out and do that? And the second part I heard you say is when you get into e-women network and different, so this is, again, we've talked about this a few times. I've had a couple of managing directors on the show in the past. Um, I love eWomen and I love NSA and other organizations like that. It's a great example, Tony, of a national organization that has a bunch of regional smaller chapters. And what I keep hearing over and over again, I think it's great advice, is it can be a great platform to really showcase, to connect, to get business from, to contribute. You're not going to get paid for it, but you're not looking to get paid for it. It's really great to grow business, but there's no shortcut to relationship. Could you speak to, to this? If I want to have a genuine relationship with you, right? And I can even say this right now. Like, Tony, I like you a lot. We've, we only, but we only talk as often as we talk usually at masterminds and events, you know, and, and whatnot. Um, this is probably the longest we've been able to have a conversation, you know, even though we've been in the same room so many times. So I like, I see someone like you and I go, man, I like Tony and she's involved in all these things and I want to have a relationship with you. Could you speak to how to approach that authentically, but also intentionally, if that makes sense? 
you know, I'm not out there to take and to, hey, I want to be your friend so I can get booked. I, you know, I want to actually get to know you and help you. What are some ways that maybe, I don't know, relationships that you've had have grown organically that you really enjoyed and you've been able to support each other, maybe other speakers and whatnot? And, and or are there any, you could go straight to what don't you do if you want to be authentic and intentional? Well, I can go to what don't you do right away. Let's do that. And, and that is, you know, send me an email and say, oh, I am so wonderful at this and I want to share it with your people because I think they need it. And it has no value to no. my audience. I mean, they hadn't done the research. They hadn't looked at the area. I managed the Calabasas um, chapter of eWomen Network. And we have 100 people in that room. And I booked all the speakers. And my biggest thing was I would always want to see where you were speaking. And I'd want to see you live before you got on my stage. Because a lot of people say they're good speakers, but you put them on a stage and it can be the longest 20 minutes of your life. So some people, what I, what I would wor- do is people would say to me, you know what, Tony, I would love to speak on your on your stage. I'd love to get to know you better. I'm having this event. I would love to have you come and be my guest. And I would show up. And I would see them live on stage and 10 out of 10 times, I would book them. So that's the way to start that kind of relationship. You know, invite me to hear you speak. And if I'm available, I would be there because that is more organic and that is more, I get to see you. I get to see how the audience reacts to you and I can hear your message and find out if it's right for my audience. Now, if you don't have that happening, I have a lot of people that reach out to me on Facebook or they reach out to me on LinkedIn. Hey, I really love what you're doing. I'd love to know more about you. Can we just have a conversation? And you might think that's kind of like, oh, everybody knows how to do that. But in reality, a lot of people, and I just got three of these this morning, (laughs) send me these emails and like, oh, I looked over your website. I really think you're great. You have interesting business. I'd love to be connected with you because I have a product that I think would be perfect. And right. so I know that I'm not going to talk to them because they're just selling me a product. They don't want to get to know me. If you come from a really genuine, hey, I saw your website. You do a lot of really great events. I'd love to learn more about that because I'm always interested in attending events and especially ones that are dynamic and engaging. Could we have a conversation or can we like talk back and forth on? on LinkedIn, little things like that. Don't always be selling. You should always be asking the other person about who are you? What are you doing? You know, I'd love to be able to support you. Let's have a conversation. It's as simple as that. So reaching out for support first. And the other thing I really appreciate about what you mentioned is when you gave me the first email, and I get a lot of these now in the podcast, you can imagine, right? Like once right. the podcast starts charting, then all of a sudden it's like PR companies and, and speakers come out of the woodworks, right? It's like they've been lurking somewhere. And there's some that I really appreciate. And one of the, one of the ones that always catches my eyes when someone says, hey, um, just wanted to reach out. One person said this. It was so cool. What a great opening line. He said, you've got a new subscriber. You or you got a new fan? Subscribe to the podcast. Really loving it. Um, I just listened to your episode on such and such, and I loved how so and so said this. And I'm like, oh, and, and maybe they only listened to five minutes halfway through one episode, but just to know that they did that, captured something from it, put to, and had to customize an email. It wasn't just a copy and paste thing. I actually read the thing, you know. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they said, you know, I really love this. So keep up the good work. Hey, I don't know if you're looking for guests, but I have someone I think this could be a really good fit for you. And it just felt, I don't know, like maybe they cared. And and I think it was um, it was intentionally done that way, right? But right. There was something about, hey, I actually know you. I didn't just say the first example you gave in LinkedIn, you know, they could have sent that exact same email to literally anybody. Hey, I love what you're doing. What an interesting company. Oh, you're so inspirational or <laughs> whatever they say. Um, so reach out and know the person, know the landscape a little bit, and then ask questions about what they're doing. You genuinely want to get to know them. And Tony, do you think, is there a shortcut? Is there an automated or leveraged approach to building real relationships? And I don't know if there's a correct answer for that, but I'm curious on your take. I don't think so. 
I, you know, in this day and age, everybody is always selling and you know that everything is automated. So you don't know, is the person really writing that email or that note, or is it an automated app that's sending out these kind of messaging? I said, so like, like you said, it was that I, I listen to your podcast. I'm a subscriber. I'm a fan. I always say, do your research, you know, get to know the person and find out number one, are you a good match with that person? And do you want to really get to know them or are you trying to sell them? If you really want to get to know them, it's just like having making a friend. Everybody has to make a friend. And if you're constantly asking questions that are yes or no, the conversation ends. Ask them probing questions. I noticed that on your website, you say blah, 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 blah. You know, I really think that that's an amazing approach to the way you do business. I like that in in the people that I'm going to do business with. Simple little things like that where it shows that you really looked into what this um, event is all about, what their messaging is. I see that you are trying to up-level women in technology and get them to be more um, visible in the business and get onto the boards instead of all male boards right now uh, in the state of California. Oh, okay. Senator um, Jackson, who we're having at this event, she has made it illegal to have a publicly traded company with not a woman on the board. So that's great, but how do I get on that board? So if you are a speaker that can speak to that and you have ways or you've done it in your past – you're a perfect speaker for that event. So if you do your homework and really look into the company and go, hey, I've got a new and different way of approaching that, but our mission is the same thing. You can always reach out to their marketing department or their PR department and say, listen, I love your company. I just think what you're doing is amazing and I want to be a part of it. I don't know what that is right now, but I just want to start this relationship and this is what I do. And this is what I believe. And it's totally in line with the values that you do. How can we work together? Love that. Now, I want to pivot into seminars and workshops a little more because that is a different world. And that's certainly the world that you're probably, would you say you're most heavily involved in that? Yes. Because you have obviously, uh, I haven't plugged it yet, but Caruso Signature Events, like your last name, it's C-A-R-U-S-O. And guys, we'll put that in the show notes too. Um, Caruso signature events. One of the biggest things Tony does is you put on workshops and seminars in what I would call the platform world. So whether it's personal development events or marketing events or business or entrepreneur events, speakers like me, I put on live workshops. Um, our friend Craig Doeswalt, that's of course where we know each other from the mastermind and from his rockstar boot camps. You produce and put on events like that for people like me and Craig. Well, you don't put on my events, but you know it's only because I have a full time person that does that <laughs> in in the office actually. Um, but hey, who knows? Who knows what the future holds? Know. No, you never, you know. never know. And that's and that's one of the reasons why I'm like I always want to. I'd love to stay close to you because you just you never know what the future holds. And a lot of my uh, students who are up and coming speakers and putting on workshops are going to need someone like that, need a company like that. So let's talk about the difference real quick. Um, my take is I talk about the keynote world, which is really usually speeches. You bring your books, you try to get hired in, and that's a whole world in and of itself, and you build yourself up to that point. But then the platform world is where you're really speaking, and you're it's in it's a business builder. So you're either speaking and giving a free gift, and you're using that to build your list, which eventually you'll uh, advertise your programs, products, and services to your list. Or sometimes you do the speak to sell and promoters want to make splits with you where you split 50-50 or maybe you keep everything. Sometimes speakers will actually sponsor and pay for events. I have a whole sponsorship budget every year. I always tell people um, that's never shy away from that because all of it can make sense. I just want to, I guess, get your opinion on how would you define or how would you describe that platform world, the seminar world? Do you agree with how I said it or do you have your own take on it? And no, then, I agree with what you said. Okay. And I believe that it is the number one way to build your business is to speak on stages. And if nobody's hiring you, I believe you should have your own stage because even if there's only 20 people in the room, those are 20 people that you can then close for your business. So So let's 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 talk about that then. So if no one's hiring you and you're not getting booked to speak, you said have your own stage. Exactly. So that, 
what what's the what what are some of the big benefits of you putting on your own event, having your own stage? Because you know, some people think, well, gosh, but how am I going to fill the room? How am I going to do that? So, can I just talk us through a little bit of if I don't know if I want to put on my first seminar ever? Um, why would I do it? How would I go about it? Um, well, I your, always tell people that they need to sit down and write down number one, what is their expectation? What is the end result they want from that event? And if it's to sell people into a mastermind or a program, that's great. And how many people do they need to sell that to to make it worth their time and effort? Maybe it's five. It could be as small as three, whatever, however number of people when they're just starting out. Now, don't do it on your own. Find someone who is in alignment with your messaging. And let's say that um, you're a life coach and you are teaching people to live their dreams. But time management isn't really your forte. But this person over here that you know is a time management expert. And you are both have the same ideal client or avatar that Mm -hmm. you're going after. But if you do it with someone and partner up, then you're only filling half the room because then they have to fill half the room. So it takes kind of the burden off of you, plus the cost is then split. So it's not so stressful for you. So if you can do it with two or three people as a group at an all-day workshop, hey, more power to you. Or if you just want to do a small couple-hour breakfast and you keynote that breakfast and you bring people in. But the idea is to understand exactly what your audience is getting out of it. Don't think about what your message is and what you want to do. It's what the audience is going to take away. You have to make sure that what you're giving, my my biggest pet peeve is when speakers get up and they say, I've got three really juicy things I want to tell you and, and share with you. And then they start going into it and they start with number one and they get into it and they go, you know, I go into this more when you're in my mastermind program. So they never finish it. You know, the idea is to give, 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 because pretty soon people are going to go, oh my gosh, I got so much. I can't do this by myself. I need to ask them to help me. And how about this? And they've given so much already. Imagine if I pay them what they would give me. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Tony. The um, the old model of like, I don't know, it's like the teasing, like, hey, I'll give you this, but you can't really get all of it unless you buy it. Um, it, it it's, it's definitely, it, it either has been in some places, but should be replaced as many places as possible. Let's, let's talk about how, how to get, get on to more of these stages. So one of the okay. things I, I teach a lot, and I, one of the, the biggest reasons why I tell people to have their own workshop, same as you, my number one reason is it gives you a platform to trade. It gives you the option of saying, look, if I'm going to have a, a room, even of 20 people, that's you would be shocked if, if, of all the names of speakers that we both know that I've said have come to rooms I've had over the years that have been 10, 12, 15 people. And right. I, I mention that because these are people that you might think, oh, come on, they would never come out for less than 200. Yeah, you know what? They drove down a couple of hours or they, you know, they, people have flown in for 18 people in the room and they were happy about it because it was 18 people they didn't know. And maybe it was a time in the career and that's what they want to do. So don't never despise small beginnings. A room exactly. that size and also, is so powerful. And also right now there are hundreds of thousands of events going on every day. People have choices to where they want to spend their money and the things they want to do. So they're not like all the Tony Robbins and the Brendan Burchard, and you had thousands of people in the room. It's not like that anymore. A room with 40 or 50 people is a big room, and it's a good audience to have. So don't think that, oh, I can't get 200 people in a room. You don't really want 200 people. You want 50 really qualified leads, people that you know need what you need, what you're giving. So. Really look at it as, I got to start somewhere, and whether or not I start with 10 people or I start with 20 people, I know it's going to grow. And isn't it better to start and make your mistakes in front of 10 people than in front of 200? So start small and tweak that speech, and each time, you know, reevaluate, reevaluate, so you have it down pat. When that opportunity to get in front of 500 people opens up, 
you can take it and you can knock it out of the park. So let's talk about then how to get booked on these seminars. So let's say we have someone who has a 50 person room, a hundred person room, and you know, and we've talked right. a lot to kind of geared towards someone who's newer, but there's a lot of people listening that, you know, you guys, you're probably, you've been at this for a few years or maybe a decade, maybe more than, than uh, Tony and I have. I don't know. Um, and you want to get on more seminars. You know, in fact, I've, I've met Tony quite a few keynote speakers lately, friends of mine that have just been keynoting their whole life, right? You know, the paid gig for companies and they're just opening up their mind to this platform thing. Wait a minute, I can go speak somewhere and not get paid, but I could offer something for sale or I could have this opt-in and then close people on coaching. Well, instead of making $5,000 once, I could get 10 $5,000 clients. What am I thinking? So if to get booked more on platform seminars, what are some, I don't know, just some ideas, some good practices on how to, you know, do I want to meet the meeting planner for it? Do I want to network and connect with the face of the company? Um, what are some effective ways to get booked onto seminars, well, I'll have the chance to either build my list or potentially even sell uh, programs and products and services from stage. Well, I think that you have to find those um, stages that you want to speak on. And I truly believe that you have to go to those events and experience them and get to know the host of the event, get to know the event planner at the event. Um, that helps a lot. When people really respect the event and show up and want to be a part of it, and then say, hey, I love what you're doing. I want to be on this stage. Most of those stages have sponsorships available. So it is a pay to play nowadays. You can share stages like um, you do with Craig. You, Craig speaks on yours. You speak on his. It's just a, it's a swap, which is great. And that's your deal with him. Well, that's but another reason are, why it's great to have your own workshop because in some cases you, you can go there first, right? Exactly. So you go to exactly. the, I love that you said, go to the event. Same, see guys, it's the same, <laughs> the exact same advice from the beginning. Go to the event, get to know someone, build a relationship. And then you can say, if you have your own event, you can say, I love what you're doing. I'd love to have you come speak at my event, right? Exactly. And then and who's going to say, no, I hate that idea. Oh, okay. I, I want to speak again. And then once you're having that conversation, maybe there's a space that you could be at their event, and you but you start that conversation. I love that. Um, continue, please. I'm sorry I, I interrupted you. That's okay. <laughs> and then there is the um, basic pay to play. You pay a certain amount, and you get a certain time on the stage. And within that agreement, whatever um, the host wants or the event producer says that it's okay for you to sell on stage because if you're paying you have to cover your costs. And we understand that. So if you're paying $10,000 to speak on a stage, you can then sell your coaching program and you sell 10 of those and you've made money. Um, then there is the, I'll speak on the stage for free, but whatever I sell, you get half of it. Yep. So the bigger the speaker you are and the better the program and the more known you are, you can get on those stages and speak for free, but you're going to have to give part of what you're offering to the event. Which I sort of look at that as from the speaker's perspective, when you do the 50-50 split, what's great about that from the speaker is it's like a sponsoring an event in a way, but it's a no risk to the speaker. Right. So if let's just take the $10,000 price you said. So A, I could go pay $10,000 and then maybe sell a $1,000 program on stage. And if I sell 10 of them, I break even. If I sell 20 of them, I doubled my ROI, right? Right. And then, of course, there's more back end that we're not counting because some of those people might upgrade to something else. But just leaving that out for a minute. On the 50-50 split, as a promoter, I don't prefer that as much because some speakers crush it. And if I know them, right? Like there's certain people that I know if I had a Mike Koenigs or something, uh, or I'm trying to think of who else, Steve Olsher. Uh, I think he just spoke at Craig's before, but he's a great, right. you know, great speaker. Um, and he's a pretty known quantity as far as how, what his conversion is. So shout out to both those guys. If you had someone that was known in the speaking sales world, okay, I know you're probably going to close about this many people. So I'd be opted as a promoter. I'd say, yeah, let's do the 50-50 split because I'll probably make at least that much or more. But when I have someone who's an unknown speaker, it's really hard to take that because what if they sell three packages and now I have a $10,000 speaking spot that I essentially gave up for $1,500, right? Exactly. 
But of course, yeah, there's also you can do the 50-50 split. It's kind of nice because if if the audience isn't great or if the room is smaller than you expect or if you were off that day, you don't have that risk of here's all my money going out up front. Right. But there's also the, um, you can lessen the risk by maybe the promoter will say, okay, instead of the $10,000 spot, I'm going to give that spot to you for $5,000 and then I get 20% of what you sell. There, uh-huh. There's different negotiations in there that you can do um, because if you are a known quantity, you can do that kind of negotiating. If not, and a lot of the smaller events that I'm doing, I have two clients right now that are straight out of Craig's Mastermind that are starting their own workshops. And what we're doing is we're selling spots on their stages for like $1,000, $800, sure. you know, so you can do that with less money. But if you think of it and you go, oh my gosh, why would I pay $800 to speak on a stage for uh, 50 minutes? And I don't know these people. I don't know the audience and they have no, um, it's their first time. I don't know what it's going to bring me. But if you realize that they're going to have a videographer there and you're going to get video of yourself, you're paying for getting right some promotional there. items that you can then use on your website. Well, that that's that's a great you know what? And that's a, what a good question to ask. So guys, like if you're looking at a sponsorship, ask, are they, what the AV structure is right up front? Because, and that is great. One of the greatest things I've gotten from Craig, a huge value in addition to being in front of the audiences and meeting new clients and everything um, is he's always videoing it. So, I mean, shoot, even on my speaker reel, I have quite a few clips and different segments that are all from his stage over the years. And he gives those to you. So he, at least he was, I don't know if he still is, but I think he is. Yes, uh, he is. Yeah, so he's giving, and and some people actually charge you a bunch extra for it. Well, if you want mm-hmm. your clip, then you got to pay. Or um, I had a student recently say they they were asking what I thought about this deal they were trying to strike, being like an educating speaker for a particular company. And I said, well, look, I mean, if you know, you could get the copy of your talk, and you could use that for some of your other promotional stuff later. And they said, no, you can't use it. And why would you want it? And if you want our video, then, you know, it's copyrighted and, and all, and it was like, you got their attitude right away. And pretty quickly they realized this is not a company that I want to associate with. Correct. Just because and of also, the scarcity and weirdness. And if you take that video and you have somebody um, transcribe it, there's a few blogs right there. And there's a chapter to a book. There's all kinds of things you can do with the information. I love it. I love it. So, But 20, I do want to say the one yeah. thing. The one thing that I think is key when we're talking about video, um, going through all these, we had a hundred applicants for the women in technology and I was going through and trying to find out about these people other than what they had in writing. So I'd go to their LinkedIn page and they didn't have their picture on their LinkedIn page, Hmm. or I would take their name and I would put it into YouTube and some had video, some didn't. The ones that had video, they're the ones that I went after first because I knew what they looked like. I knew they could talk um, and be heard and understood. I knew that they could dress appropriately, you know, because you have to look at all those things. So the better the video you have and the more you have of it, showing yourself on a stage, an event producer like myself goes, oh my goodness, they've done this before. They know what they're doing. Now, it might have been a small little stage. You might have been the only one in the room and there was no audience. I don't know that. So you need to have that video in your speaker package so that people can see you speaking because that's really key to getting booked. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Tony, as we're coming to kind of the twilight of our time together, uh, I want to come back also to you know, to the idea of putting on an event. So I might be thinking, and again, guys, Tony is one of the most brilliant minds at this. I've watched her at work. I've known her for years doing this. And you know what the neat thing is too? This industry, people talk about people and whether you you subscribe to that or not, I'm not a gossiper, but people talk about people. And usually you hear little things here and there. And someone says, hey, what do you think about you know this person? And you go, well, you know, they're this, they're that. And Tony, you're one of the people I've never heard a bad thing about ever. And all I've ever heard is people saying how much they adore you. Um, and at the same time, how, what's the word I'm looking for? Structured, uh, your follow through, your character, your, the discipline of your business practice, your professionalism. That's the word I'm looking for. 
you have this beautiful blend of super professional, but like teddy bear caring, you know, it's like, it's it, like what a person to help put on an event. So guys, Tony has a book and the book is called event production mastery. And it's a workbook for you putting on your own event. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about the book event production mastery, Tony? And the second part of that is who needs that? What level, what size do you need to be? Is this for a brand new person wanting to put on a lunch and learn, or is this for an established speaker to take their workshops to the next level everywhere in between? Talk to us about who it's for and then tell me a little bit about the book if you would. I think it's for everyone. It's a really good educational tool for those just starting out because it talks about, you know, what's your why, why are you doing it? What's your expectation? What are your goals? It takes you through the budgeting process. It takes you through negotiating um, your contracts but on a higher level, I believe that everyone should have their event paid for before the event door is even open. So I'm very big on putting butts in seats and how to use sponsorships and affiliates and influencers to help you fill your room and to pay for your event. So if you're at that part where you've been doing smaller events and you want to upscale, this book will help you do that also. So it's a little bit for everybody. Nice. And how do we get that? Now, you, you can follow Tony, just so you know, you can follow her at Instagram at Tony. It's T-O-N-I, the cool way to say Tony. Uh, <laughs> Tony Caruso 74 at Instagram. We'll have a link in there in the show notes. And then Facebook is Tony.Lupino.Caruso. And again, we'll have uh, Instagram, Facebook, and all your social will be in there. Uh, her website is Caruso Signature Events. So check out Caruso Signature Events and you can get, there's a lot of great resource and ideas on there about how to do an event, uh, event purposes, and you can get a really good showcase of how Tony and her team do events from the small to the grand ones. Uh, how do we get your book and uh, is it just available wherever books are sold or what do you want to do for that? No, I want to give it to you for free. It's a downloadable ebook. And just go to rockstarcoordinator at gmail.com and I will send it to you as soon as I get your email. You'll get Stop. it within 24 hours. Stop it. You're just gonna give you're just gonna give us your book? Yeah, I'm giving it free. Come on, that's so cool. Thank you, Tony. Well, it's Easter week and it's a giving time. <laughs> All right, so here we go. If you email rockstarcoordinator at gmail.com, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Uh, do it now. Like look at if if you're listening to this on your phone, literally unless you're driving, pull over, stop. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, be like while you still remember it, this is a critical thing. Whether you've done an event before or you've never even thought about doing it yet, grab Tony's book, Event Production Mastery. Email her at rockstarcoordinator at gmail.com. And what do you say? Just, um, I, want, I want the book. Yeah. Say, I want the book. Uh, I heard John Matt's podcast. I want the book. And, and Tony will send you her book and you can start mastering your own live events, which remember can help you get booked on other people's stages can make income because you can, of course, sell your masterminds, coaching programs, et cetera, from it. It's a great way to partner with other people that you can put an event on together. There's so many different ways. We're going to continue in the course of this podcast, of course, talking with other people uh, around this. I'm going to give you some training and concepts around this. Tony, thank you so much for your time today. You've been just such a gem and so giving um, of all your ideas and and I feel supported. And I feel, honestly, I feel inspired. I am ready to get out and I want to put on an event. Let's do this. <laughs> You're so cute. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Tony. All right, guys, that is the show this week. Hope that was valuable for you. We talked, like I said, about uh, getting booked for seminars and workshops. Uh, and we also talked a little bit about associations and so, and so much more. So that was Tony Caruso. Follow Tony Instagram and Facebook. It's T-O-N-I and then C-A-R-U-S-O, Tony Caruso. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this show. Uh, if you listen to it just as a one-off, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Google Play, iHeart, you know, all the places that you get podcasts. I know which, I, you know how to do this. So subscribe and rate and review. I really appreciate rating and reviewing. Even if you've reviewed our other shows, make sure you review this one. Let people know how much value comes out of this for you. Uh, as usual, I'm looking forward to seeing you on stage. <laughs>